Welcome to the Legal Academy, Episode 6. My name is Oren Kerr, your host. Uh, my guest this week is Pam Carlin, the uh, Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law and Co-Director of the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic at Stanford Law School. Uh, you probably know who Pam Carlin is, uh, but just to give you an idea, if you have not, uh, if you're not familiar with her bio, she has uh, she joined the faculty at Stanford Law School in 1998 after 10 years at the University of Virginia. Uh, before that, she had been a law clerk at the Supreme Court for Justice Blackmun uh, and spent, I think, two years at the NAACP Legal Defense uh, and Education Fund uh, before joining academia. Uh, as a member of the academy, I, I like to think, uh, uh, Pam, you, you've kind of done it all. You've, you've covered so many aspects of uh, being a law professor, and every time at the highest level, um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you to the show. Well, thanks for having me so much, Warren. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of your work, which we just actually cited some of in a brief that we're about to file at the Supreme Court. So. All right. Well, that, that sounds good, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted to start with the, the fact that you have done all of these different things. And just to sort of, you know, raise a couple of them, not only have you written you know, almost 100 law review articles, including a Supreme Court forward and sort of dozens and dozens of prominent uh, major articles on constitutional law and voting rights. Uh, you have litigated cases at the Supreme Court at the highest level, uh, including the Bostick versus Clayton County case, which uh, major victory that just came out a few days ago, for those of you that may be watching this a at a later time. Um, you are a co-author of several prominent case books. Uh, you have served in government. You have done all of these things in the legal world and sort of in, in, in different aspects of this job uh, as a law professor. And what I want to know is how do you see these things fitting together? Um, you, do you see sort of see one of them as a primary role and others as sort of fun things to do on the side? Does it all kind of work together? When, when you sort of think about how to spend your time, how, is it all just whatever's interesting or is there a theme or a rhyme and reason in terms of which, which part of your time you're going to spend on these different projects that you do? So I think that the things are interlocked and I would say, especially at the beginning of your career, they have to be because you don't have the intellectual capital and you don't have the time to both learn the subjects you're gonna be teaching uh, in law school and writing about in law school and then doing litigation that's totally unrelated to that or the like. So, you know, when I first started uh, teaching, I was coming out of a job litigating voting rights and Title VII cases uh, on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And so the early litigation work that I did when I went into academe was almost entirely work that I either brought with me from the Legal Defense Fund and kept working on, or it was work that came to me uh, through people I knew who were also doing Title VII cases or also doing uh, reproductive rights cases because I clerked for Justice Blackman uh, and the like. I mean, as I've gotten more comfortable with and developed more, um, you know, just more knowledge, uh, I now find that almost all of the litigation I do, I would say 90 something percent of it easily, I do through the Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. And so it is part of my teaching mission uh, to teach students how to write persuasive briefs uh, and how to think strategically about the Supreme Court. And so, you know, I, I, I like to think that each of these things feeds on the other, that I get ideas for, for what I'm going to write, uh, both from my classes and from my litigation, and I get ideas about how to litigate from the way I've been teaching, uh, uh, been teaching, you know, issues that also arise in the litigation. Let me focus a little bit on your articles you've written by my count, by my quick Westlaw check, o almost 100 articles, and probably there are many that are not on Westlaw. Uh, but do you have favorites among the articles you've written, or articles where you look back and you go, yeah, I really nailed this one? Or, and then the flip side of this, do you have certain articles that you think, yeah, that one didn't didn't pan out so well in retrospect. And to the extent you kind of can look back and see which ones you you're most proud of, or maybe least least proud of. Like, is there a theme as to how you got there? Or is it just you sort of put put it all out there, and then later on you figure it out which ones maybe work better or, or less well? Yeah. So if I had to say, like the articles that I think I'm proudest of are ones that come up with an idea that then can play out in, a, in, a, in, in other people's work as well. So um, I would say the three that did that the most uh, are early articles in my career, but maybe the later articles will have that effect uh, as, they, as, as pe more people read them and like. But one of them was an article called uh, The Rights to Vote 
which laid out a taxonomy of how to think about voting rights cases, that they're first generation cases about the right to participate, cast a ballot and have it counted. They're second generation cases, which are really about the aggregation rules, figuring out who's gonna win, districting as, a, as an obvious example of that. And then there's a potential third generation of cases that are really about governance issues that are not so much about my ability to cast a ballot or my ability to elect the candidate I prefer, but how the overall system uh, is organized. Um, and the one person, one vote cases actually turn out in large part to be about this governance idea, not about the other two, because really what people cared about was the disproportionate uh, number of rural legislators or legislators from underpopulated areas of the state. So that article, I think, has had a lot of traction because a lot of people now think about the three generations of voting rights. Um, the other election law related article that I wrote like that was when I co-wrote with Sam Zakroff that's on what's called the hydraulic principle. And this is the idea that you can't squeeze the money out of politics. When you squeeze it out in one place, you dam it up in one place, it flows out somewhere else. And that the ecosystem is really what scholars uh, and people who are trying to engage in law reform should think about. And so that article, I think, has had uh, a major effect. People talk about the hydraulics of all sorts of election law related things now. Then the third article was actually, I had a period of time where I was writing a bunch of criminal procedure articles, constitutional criminal procedure articles. And this is an article that was about uh, whether you should level up or level down as the way of ensuring equal protection in criminal procedure. Um, and I think this idea of leveling up and leveling down comes out in a lot of different areas of law. Um, so those are ones that, you know, I look back on those and I think, boy, you know, every time I look at those articles again, I really like them. Um, and I've written a series of articles that are about what I call the stereoscopic view of uh, the 14th Amendment, that the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause actually inter interweave with each other and they kind of mutually support each other. And there are a number of cases and doctrines that lie at the intersection of the two. Articles I'm not so happy with. Um, sometimes I agreed to go to a symposium and I didn't really have a huge amount to say. And so I had to come up with essentially the equivalent of a case comment. And I think some of those, you know, I look back on them and I don't think there's anything deeply wrong with those articles, but I also don't think to myself, 10 years from now, anyone will find this article useful or interesting or, or helpful. So, you know, I think things that I wrote uh, on command, on commission sometimes, are less good than the things that just spontaneously came to me. And then I thought, oh, uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll publish this idea that I've had. A, a lot of uh, professors, especially junior professors, have described um, the experience of writing an article and going back and forth between thinking, this is terrible and this is great. I'm so happy with this. This is a disaster. And that's sort of the, the internal monologue about how their own article is going. In, in those examples, did you sort of know as you were writing them, like in the great articles, like I've got something or in the article that was just the case comment, like, you know, this is just why am I doing this? Did you know at the time or is it in retrospect that you get the reaction of the, that you're talking I, well, about? Well, I knew at the time. So for example, the second article I wrote really was too closely tied to a couple of cases to really be an interesting article. Um, and occasionally I just, you know, I, I didn't really have an idea that was ready to write, but I had to write something for a symposium. Um, or, uh, or for a lecture that I'd agreed to give. And I found myself thinking, you know, I don't, I, I still remember a famous, famous professor, I will not name, not a law professor, but he came to give a lecture at UVA when I was in my second year there. And midway through the lecture, he, he made this gesture and his notes went onto the floor and he picked them up and he put them back on the lectern and he started reading. And about every four or five minutes, there'd be this total disjoint and I realized after about two or three of these that he had just picked the papers up in the wrong order. And he was so indifferent as to whether his audience would understand what he was saying or anything that he was just reading it anyway. And I came out of the lecture and I remember saying to one of my senior colleagues, if I ever get famous enough to do that, I want you to come and put a pillow over my head because I don't want to live like that. And I think the moment at which you lose a sense of shame is the moment at which you start saying things that you really will end up being ashamed of later. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to avoid that. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Um, you, you, one thing you've done, uh, uh, which um, I know especially junior scholars kind of struggle with whether to spend time on it, is case books. Uh, you've got several case books, uh, constitutional law case books, and other other field related areas. There, I think there's a, a debate, especially among more junior scholars. You know, is it worth spending time on case books? And I, you know, I, I'm on a couple of case books. I spent a lot of time uh, on that. Um, but I think there's a sense of you know maybe our case books. I don't know if it's they're on their way out or at least they're not scholarship. Do you have a sense of do you, do you see case books as fitting in with your scholarly work? Is it just kind of a thing to do because it's a service to the community? People need books in order to assign books. It sort of makes it easier. The world must be people, doesn't that? <laughs> that from um, the Tempest. How uh, how how to think about that question? So here's the thing. I think ten years from now, if you're a younger scholar, do not invest your life in a case book in a, an already existing field because 10 years from now, case books are going to be gone or at least they're going to have morphed into something so unlike what they are now where, um, you know, where it's a, a solid book. Um, I think it's going to become digital. I think it's going to become uh, professors plucking who are teaching a course, plucking different units from different case books, even perhaps from different publishers. Um, so I would be really surprised. Um, I would say the case books that I'm on, there, there are three of them, and they're quite different from one another in the following sense. Uh, I'm, the, I'm still the junior author, low into my seventh decade, on the, the Stone Sideman book, uh, which is a constitutional law book. I don't think in constitutional law, unless you're going to be very idiosyncratic, and there's some wonderfully idiosyncratic books out there, you're really dealing with the the canonical cases, um, the organization of the book is pretty much set by the canons and by the, the way the doctrine's set up. And you can, you know, I think our book has more scholarship in it and longer chunks of opinions than some other books, but really there's not much room for huge innovation. By contrast, I think the Law of Democracy book that I did originally with Sam Azakroff and Rick Peldis and now uh, with Nate Persley as well, we kind of made a field there. That is, before that book, I don't think people were mostly thinking that all of these areas were connected. Um, they were taught in constitutional law, but they were taught in different aspects of the constitutional law class. So, you know, a First Amendment class might teach campaign finance, um, a class on the Equal Protection Clause or racial justice might teach the white primary cases, but nobody talked about them all together. And so if, if you're in an area where you think you can make the field and set out the boundaries of the field by doing a case book, then I think you're doing two things. One is I think you're doing genuine scholarship because you're doing genuine conceptual thinking in, in writing the book. Uh, and you're performing a service because um, it's not as if your colleagues at other schools who might be interested in teaching in the area will have thought about these things in the same way. And so you're providing them with materials. Um, but you know, if I were if I were thinking about it today, I would not go on to a constitutional law case book. I wouldn't go on to a torts case book or the like. Um, you know, for you, um, you know, a lot of the stuff you're doing that's very new and innovative because it's dealing with the digital world and privacy in the digital world, that's an area where you really can write a casebook that makes a difference. But, you know, general crim pro, I mean, there's the Fourth Amendment, there's the Fifth Amendment, there's the Sixth Amendment, there's the Eighth Amendment, there's a little bit of habeas. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine that there's a lot of conceptualizing in a casebook there. And then do you, does that carry over to treatise work, which I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, you're not, you're not also do. No, no, this. I, I um, have not done, I have not done any treatise work uh, and I do not intend to do any treatise work. And do, do you have sort of a similar sense that maybe, but, the you know, their treatises, are, treatises like... are really useful in my litigation. I'm not sure they're super litigate useful in my scholarship, but they're super important, like the restatements as well. In litigation, it's really useful. But but I, I gather sort of not not scholarship from the standpoint, or at least hard to make it one that's really deeply about scholarship in the same way. Well, as I, I, I think it is scholarship, you know, of, of 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 an important sort. It's an old fashioned kind of scholarship, and it's not the kind of thing to the extent that you and I are talking now about what would be useful to people in the on the uh, upward 
uh, slope of their careers, it's not something that most of them can do at that point because you don't get, you don't really yet know enough to write a treatise on anything other than a very narrow issue. Yeah, fair, fair, good, good point. You also now spend a lot of time at the Supreme Court Clinic. You're a co-director of the Stanford yeah. uh, Supreme Court Clinic, and and I want to talk about the clinic because for for a couple of reasons. One is that I have not yet in episodes talked about. Uh, clinical education and the clinical side of legal academia, which I'm going to change. I'm going to be having, you know, clinicians on, I think is a really important part of the overall picture. So, so one is to sort of get a little bit of that perspective sure. uh, in here. Uh, and, and the second is to focus on the, the Stanford Supreme Court Clinic in particular, which is sort of one of um, a small number of Supreme Court focused clinics and probably the one that is doing the most um, Supreme Court litigation. You guys have have your hands on a lot of different really important cases and are doing them at a, a very high level. Uh, and, and I want to I ask sort of how, how do you see the role of the clinic with, within the university, within the law school, um, both in terms of your sense of kind of clinical education generally and also a Supreme Court clinic specifically? Sure. So um, on the Supreme Court clinic specifically, let me do that first and then talk about it more generally. One of the things that um, Jeff Fisher always says to the students at the very beginning of the quarter is, you know, people out there in the world might think, how can it be that second year and third year law students are litigating cases at the Supreme Court? Uh, shouldn't you be dealing with, you know, traffic tickets or misdemeanors or something like that? And he always pauses that and that, at that point says, you need to understand, like after your first and second years of law school, the only thing you know about is litigating Supreme Court cases, right? I mean, that's what all of the case method and reading all these appellate cases kind of gets you in the habit of doing, gets you in the kind of mind habit of doing. And the idea of like actually talking to a client is far more daunting, I think, to a lot of students than talking about whether the Supreme Court uh, should stick with an issue or should abandon stare decisis or whether it should extend the Fourth Amendment in this direction or the Equal Protection Clause in that direction. So it, it, in, in an odd way, the students are, are perhaps more equipped in some ways. And those of us who are uh, non-clinical academics are more equipped to teach them how to litigate the Supreme Court than teach them how to go into Superior Court. Um, I mean, you know, I, I did a fair number of trials and hearings at the Legal Defense Fund, but I never did a jury case because not all of my cases involved equitable relief. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't really know how to pick a jury at all, but between clerking and studying the Supreme Court and, you know, doing a bit of Supreme Court litigation at the Legal Defense Fund, you know, that wasn't so hard. Um, how did clinical education fit in? You know, we are a professional school and we're supposed to be training people into a profession. And the idea that, you know, for years and years and years, law schools didn't have clinics at all, uh, or clinics were really a kind of uh, sort of backward sister of the law school is a real mistake because um, students who do clinical work come back into their regular classes with a new appreciation of what it means to be a lawyer, how to think strategically, how to think tactically, um, how inequality in the world affects them. So I think, you know, one of the things that Stanford was ironically lucky about is we were so far behind the curve on clinical education. Um, you know, when I got to Stanford, we had essentially one and a half clinics uh, that when we finally ramped up, we were able to do it in a way where we have a, a, a slew of different clinics that do hugely different stuff one from another. Everything from a clinic that does criminal expungements uh, and evictions to a clinic that deals with innovation policy. Do, do you have a sense of um, how to grapple with issues that I, on past faculties I have been on specifically, I should say, um, you grappling with questions of equality between clinicians and non-clinicians where, you know, what are the standards for hiring or what are the standards for tenure, um, having tenure for clinicians, voting rights. There's, there, my sense is that historically you sort of have like the um, podium faculty or the non-clinician faculty that were there and then clinicians arrived and are doing some things that are similar, some things that are different. And that there's been a little bit of a kind of a uncertainty or struggle over how to fit in the various components within a faculty. 
Um, do you have a sense of how best to do that? Is it just flat equality, it's all the same, or are there differences and how to, how to go about kind of, you know, whenever you introduce a difference, you've got to kind of figure out how to fit that together on a, on a cohesive faculty. How, how should schools do that? Yeah, that, that's a hard question because at the same time that schools were bringing in um, large numbers of clinical faculty, they also were changing their, their their hiring standards and their way of thinking about their non-clinical faculty, their podium faculty. So that uh, now if you look at the kind of entering faculty um, at, at most schools, if you look at the entering clinical faculty, they all did really well in law school, but then they went out and actually practiced in the area that you're hiring them to be a clinician in. Um, so just to take an example, um, you know, in our clinic uh, this year, we've just added a third uh, full-time faculty member to the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, um, a guy named Brian Fletcher, who spent five or six years at the Solicitor General's office. So he's argued, I don't know, 15 cases at the Supreme Court. He was, um, you know, he was at a law firm before that. He clerked for two years. You know, he has the profile that when I was entering the legal academy would have been the profile for non-clinical faculty as well. Today though, you know, that's how we hire on the clinical side. You know, people who are either already super eminent if you're hiring them to be a director or a, or a full faculty member, or if you're hiring them to be a junior fellow, um, people who have five or six years of experience or a dozen years even of experience doing the kind of work that they're going to be teaching the students to do. Because you really can't teach students to do this work if you haven't done it. On the academic side, though, we've moved more and more towards hiring people who look like their colleagues in departments of arts and letters across universities or humanities and sciences at Stanford. So they're mostly people with PhDs. Uh, many of them have very little practice experience. Um, and uh, they never aspired. This is the other thing that's really interesting. They never aspired to do what we're training our students to do. That is, they didn't go to law school thinking they'd be lawyers and then fall in love with the law in a way that made teaching the right career for them, which is kind of my, my path into teaching. I didn't go to law school thinking I wanted to be a professor. I went to law school thinking I wanted to work at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, but today, huge numbers of people, like at Admitted Students Weekend, do you get this question at Admitted Students Weekend where people say to you, so tell me if I come here, you know, is that a good thing for becoming a law professor? And you feel like saying to them, you've never done anything in law. You don't know whether you like it. You don't know whether you're good at it. And yet you've already decided you want to be a professor of it. That's just weird. Um, but a huge number of the people on the entry level uh, job market never really wanted to be lawyers. Um, and so trying to build into the governance structure of a school, one group of, two groups of people who often I think have a certain level of discomfort with the other group is it, hard to do. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that any school has gotten it 100% right. I noticed some schools have had have like a professor of practice slot, sort of a non-clinical teaching yeah. position. Yeah, we have one of those. Yeah, and, and I think Harvard has like a, a bunch of them, at least in yeah. my mind, I think of Harvard yeah. is having a lot. I mean, is that is that a way f forward? Because I, I, I do have the sense of, especially with um, podium faculty being more PhD oriented and less legally oriented, and then um, you have clinical faculty that are, are, are legally oriented and, and in many schools are te the same teaching load, the same matters. Um, and then in addition to that, working on clinical issues, it's, there is a sort of split as you suggest. And I, are professors from practice kind of a way of also kind of rooting people more to the legal world or is that not something that- You know, I think what professors of practice usually are are people who are pretty prominent practitioners that you just wanna have around your school for in large part for enrichment purposes. Enrichment, often enrichment of the faculty more than um, enrichment necessarily of the, of the students. Um, and they, you know, I'm not sure that that's a category that you'd want to expand dramatically um, because it would, I think that would create huge tensions. If you have a bunch of people who don't have the huge teaching responsibilities of clinical faculty, 
and don't have the huge research responsibilities of um, the podium faculty, then the question is, well, what exactly are they doing there? Um, and it can be useful to have a couple of them, but I don't think it's an, it's an emerging new category that's gonna have anywhere near the number of people in it that clinical faculty has or that non-clinical faculty has. One issue that I've talked about with some prior uh, guests on the show is the difficulty of uh, faculty members at law schools um, knowing enough about what their colleagues are doing to participate in workshops or uh, participate in the hiring process where you might have to say, you know, this person's work is good enough or this person's work is not good enough. Yeah. Um, do you have thoughts on how schools should deal with that? problem, uh, or to the extent it is a problem, maybe it's not a problem, um, but in terms of either deferring to the folks that are subject matter experts in that particular area, or sort of having everybody get up to speed to the extent possible on the different fields. Um, you, this is sort of the, how can we all be together <laughs> as a faculty question, um, which which I, 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 I struggle with a lot, kind of see it, it brings together a lot of questions, I think, of how do we do this job as a group rather than just as individuals? Yeah, I mean, I think the place that that comes out most it, with most difficulty is not so much in faculty workshops, because in faculty workshops, um, oftentimes the presenter understands that he or she is presenting to a group of people uh, who are not necessarily 100% familiar with the method that the person's using or the subject matter that the person's focused on. I think where the real tensions come out is in the appointments process, where uh, sometimes you have kind of almost tribal, either, either people will insist that they should have a veto over anybody who might be uh, in their field, and their field expands or contracts depending on how they, how they think about the individuals involved, or they just want more people like them. Uh, and they and they don't think that the people who are doing something else are really ought to be in the academy. So sometimes you know sometimes you'll have people who um, who, who assume that um, something should be done somewhere else in the university, not in the law school, or you'll have people uh, who think that because they went to law school they are great judges of all doctrinal scholarship because they spent two years studying doctrines in various survey courses. Um, and so those two groups, I think there's a lot of tension between them. Um, and in periods of time where faculty slots are, are scarce, there can be a lot of tension over, should we hire another person doing X? And there's some areas, it's really interesting, there's some areas that for the entire time I've been in the academy, Schools have been searching frantically to try and fill. And there are other areas where there seems to be just an explosion of great young talent. Um, and it's not clear to me like what, what accounts for that. But it means, for example, that if you are you know, in, in constitutional law, everybody on your faculty really kind of feels like they're capable of judging constitutional law scholarship. Um, even if what they're really doing is being sort of like intelligent lay readers almost of it. Um, whereas, you know, at the other extreme, when it comes to certain kinds of quantitative scholarship, most of the people on the faculty think, well, I can't judge this stuff at all. So I'm going to leave to the, the quantitative people the, you know, the judging of the scholarship. And when it comes to the method, that's probably right. But when it comes to whether the question that's being answered is an interesting or important one, I think that's probably mistaken. I think everybody on the faculty should be capable of thinking about, is this a question that deserves a fair amount of time? Is it an interesting question that's being answered? Do, do you have a sense that something is lost as we move to a more PhD oriented world in that it's, it's interesting, just going back to your answer a, a, few, a few minutes ago, um, to how you see your work fitting together and often kind of following from your practice experience at the N NDA, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, you know, you, you had a set of problems that you were interested in that you were exposed to in a community that you were 
that you knew, and, and it seems like your scholarly ideas were in part, at least at the, especially at the beginning, kind of from that. And I, I had a similar experience where I was at the Justice Department in the computer crime section, seeing all these legal issues and thinking like, wow, this is really cool. I should go write about this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I was hearing Tim Wu talk about at, at Columbia, his experience and a lot of his ideas came from some problems he worked on when he, he was junior. It seems like a, a, a good number of people who have legal practice experience end up writing about or inspired by issues they saw. And then when you switch over to the, uh, a world in which more and more people have PhDs uh, uh, and, and for which the practice part is narrow, that, you know, are, are we losing that connection from a scholarly standpoint in a world where we have so many people that are coming from PhDs or are spending you know, five or six years in whatever program they're taking, sort of getting ready to go on the market, less, less focused on practice? So I have two worries about that. One is that, you know, the ability to keep practicing for me has spun off huge numbers of ideas. So it's not just the things I learned when I was at the Legal Defense because, hey, the Supreme Court got rid of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So I'm not writing about, I'm not writing about that anymore. It's kind of like Dead Poets Society, you know, rip that out of your book. It's not law anymore. Um, you know, and 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 the likes, but but I get ideas for stuff from the cases I'm working on 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 now, um, and I worry that if you really are primarily rooted in another discipline, but you're in a law school, so you have to be spending a bunch of time teaching first year contracts or first year torts or corporations or whatever, that it's not going to generate ideas for you. And there's a limit to how long you can live off the intellectual capital you developed in graduate school in a cognate field. Um, and so, you know, after they've turned the dissertation into a couple of articles or into a book, what do they do next? Um, and I think some of them have been really successful at finding other things to write about, um, but some of them just kind of get tenure and then retreat into their other discipline in a way. So there, there's that fear, which is where are your next round of ideas going to come from? And are they going to be law related in some way that makes it worth it for a university to have given you one of its billets in the law school? The other thing that I worry about is um, a lot of what we're doing, as I said before, is being a professional school. And we are training people to do something important and useful which is to be lawyers. And if, you, if you're not interested in that at all, then the temptation will be to teach your classes in a way that is much more like undergraduate classes than it is like law classes. That is, it, it's lecturing about some area of law that interests you, but not really trying to train the students to be lawyers in some way. Um, and, and that worries me because I think that then means that a huge part of that burden moves on to the clinical faculty um, because, and, and the other thing about this, I should say, this has probably been your experience as well, is there is a value, a really important value to having junior faculty who are closer in a variety of ways to the students than senior faculty can be um, and who serve, who serve a role in the institution that involves the students modeling themselves on those younger faculty in various ways. And if the younger faculty convey to the students that, well, of course, if you were smart, you'd go into teaching, only people who can't teach practice. Um, you know, it's the kind of the flip up of those who can do, those who can't teach, it's those who can teach, those who can't do. Um, that's not good for the culture of the school. Do, do you have advice for law students who are interested in becoming professors. Uh, this is maybe the, the sure. student who shows up at your orientation and says, how do I become a professor? Um, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> like what, how, you know, in terms of either um, working with a professor or trying to write when in law school or how to think about um, developing a scholarly career. Do you have, when students come to you and ask you, you know, what, what should I do to become a law professor? What do you tell them? Well, one thing is they should read a lot of legal scholarship of a kind that interests them. And, you know, I'm 
pretty Catholic in my tastes about that. If you want to be a law and economics person, read law and economics scholarship. If you want to do crim pro, read crim pro scholarship and see whether the scholarship that's being done in the area of law that interests you is something that you might be interested in doing yourself. Um, because I think, you know, for especially for students, the most visible part of being a professor from a student's point of view is getting up in class and teaching. Um, you know, Harold Coe had this line once where he said something like, you know, the weird thing about our job is the thing we do most in public is the thing that our colleagues know the least about our work on. And the thing we do most in private is the thing that our colleagues know the most about because they read our scholarship. But for students, it's exactly the opposite, which is I think when students think about being a professor, they think, oh, this would be a great job because you're in class like six hours a week. Um, you've got the summers off. You can think about whatever you want to think about. And they don't, they don't really think about how much do I want to do legal scholarship? Um, and the thing is, this is the greatest job in the world if you like doing legal scholarship. But if you don't like doing it, it's the most painful job in the world because there'll be six or seven years of super anxiety while you're trying to get tenure. And then if you get tenure and you stop writing, there'll be a lifetime of knowing that your colleagues hold you in vague contempt and think of you as a mistake, right? So you need to figure out, do you wanna, do you wanna write legal scholarship? Um, and the best way to figure that out is to read legal scholarship and to try doing some. While in law school, you mean? That this yeah, you know, right. writing a student note. I don't mean, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things you've probably seen this as well is you now look at people who are on the teaching market and they have more publications than they would need to get tenure. But none of them is really great because they just keep cranking out like every student paper you can get published somewhere. Um, and so I don't really feel like you need to write like five articles while you're in law school. Um, but you should try writing something just to see, do you like writing? Because not everybody does. I, I want to um, talk, this is probably the last, last set of topics, on, on, on sort of um, faculty questions. A lot, a lot of times faculties grapple with um, how large should we be? Should we be expanding the faculty, assuming we have the, the means to do that? Um, and should we be hiring junior people uh, who, as you mentioned, might sort of be more connected to students or maybe more senior people who may have a more prominent scholarly reputation? Do you, do you have a sense of how to go about those kind of self-definition questions of, of how big we should be, where should we be hiring when, when schools get together and try to figure those questions out? What, what, what's your take? So the how big you should be, I, I don't really know how to answer that because you know there are some wonderful, very small faculties and they have the great advantage that everybody knows what everybody else is working on and everybody uh, feels connected and invested in everybody. And then there's some great super large faculties where people don't know each other at all. I mean, I'll never forget um, the year that I visited at Harvard as walking across the campus with a junior faculty member and a senior faculty member was coming, who was in the junior faculty member was in the first year of teaching them, maybe the second, and a senior faculty member came the other way, and I kind of, uh, oh no, I was walking with a senior faculty member, and the junior faculty member was coming towards us, and I waved and said hi to the junior faculty member, and the senior faculty member said to me, "Who's that?" <laughs> and I realized they just didn't even know all of their junior colleagues. I mean, you know, so that's a problem. Um, so on the size, I don't, I don't have a strong view one way, or, one way or the other. On the, on the kind of demographic profile of the faculty, I think it's really important to have junior faculty who throw themselves into the institution in ways that senior faculty don't. I think, you know, any, it, it, there's, there's all this research on, you know, like how many points different traumatic events in your life can have, and it's like death of a spouse is like a hundred points, death of a child's a hundred points, you know. Um, stubbing your toe is like point one point. I think moving, picky, selling your house, buying a new house, moving to the new house and getting assimilated in it is a pretty stressful thing. And, you know, I like to think that I've thrown myself into the institution here at Stanford, but in comparison to how much I threw myself into UVA, I'm not sure. Um, and I think on average, that's probably true for most people that, you know, the first school that somebody's at, they will throw themselves into in a way that 
either because you don't have the energy again or because now you're much more Im embedded in your scholarly network of people or because now you've got kids or a spouse or you're just old and tired, whatever it is. People don't throw themselves into places again and again and again. I mean, I remember Bill Stuntz, who was, you know, dear, dear friend and probably the wisest person in our generation in legal academia, once saying to me, he thought anytime somebody went to their dean and said, you know, give me X or I'm going to leave, the dean should almost always say, we have really appreciated having you here. <laughs> um, because his view was losing your faculty after the point when they've done their best work is not a huge cost to a university. On the other hand, deans seem absolutely obsessed with retaining their faculty. Almost all deans do it at almost any cost. Um, and I think that's a mistake. Um, you know, one of the reasons among so many why I never wanted to become a dean is I didn't think that I was capable of saying to somebody who came in and said, give me less teaching or I'm going to leave. My reaction would be, if you can find a place that the teaching load is more to your liking, go with God, you know, um, because I don't think that there are very many faculty where it would be a tragedy for a school to lose them. And almost all the people where I think it would be a tragedy, it's not because of the person's eminence in the outside world. It's because the person is critical to the way that school operates. You know, if I, if, 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 if I was, if I was in a lifeboat with all of my faculty and I had to figure out like, who do you throw off the lifeboat? You know, who's the cabin boy you're going to eat? Um, you know, I think that there are some people who have big scholarly reputations who would be off the boat before some people who constantly pick up the administrative work around the school that needs to be done, are incredibly wise, are great readers of other people's work and commenters on other people's work. I mean, those are the people that you most need to keep. And I think a lot of those are people that institutions grow themselves rather than people they go out and, and pluck from another school. And, and is the dean's perspective, as you say, sort of, you know, deans will try to retain faculty. Um, is that because the deans are more focused on the external perception of the school, which is based on, you know, is big name person there versus necessarily the internal question of who's asking great questions at, at workshops? You know, is it just yeah. they have that different perspective, which, which may be totally legitimate, right? It may, may just be like they're focused on a set of one concerns and the internal faculty is focused on a different concerns or, yeah, or is it something else that you think explains that? I, I think, I think that there's some of that and some of it is also just the, the kind of winner's curse, right? You'll overbid um, because the person who overbids relative to the actual worth of anything is most likely to get it in an auction. Um, and the other thing is that this has a, this has a gender component to it, I think as well, which is, um, uh, one of the then vice provosts at Stanford told me this about the university in general. So it's not, it, it's not specific to the law school, which is um, women do not go out and get offers from other schools in an attempt to leverage better treatment at their home institution. So if they get an offer from another school, they either take it or they turn it down, but they don't generally negotiate over it. Men, on the other hand, will often go out and get another offer for the purpose of uh, leveraging that offer. Um, and she told me that a lot of the differential in salary in other parts of the university, I don't know in the law school so much, was due to this, that, that, that this explained some of the gender gap in salary is that the men would come in and say, I have an offer for X amount at place Y, match it or I'm leaving. And women just wouldn't do that. Um, and I think, you know, there's been, so, there's been some recent um, blog traffic over you know whether the requirement in law the, the kind of conventional requirement in law which isn't true in other disciplines that you have to do a full-scale visit before you can get a lateral offer has effects on people's mobility that's differential for um, either men who have wives who are prepared to move with them versus women who don't have uh, wives or husbands who are prepared to move with them so, you know, so it's all very difficult. And this is why, you know, I'm, I'm so committed to the idea we should do entry level hiring, but frustrated by the, by the fact that what now seems to happen, um, are you a baseball fan? No, not really. 
Oh, well, then this this analogy will not interest you as much as it might interest those of your listeners who are. But for a long time, um, there in the baseball draft, they would draft a lot of high school pitchers who would turn out to be not that great vis-a-vis -vis college pitchers with statistics that weren't as good. But the college pitchers were in we're competing in a better league in a way. And here's what the worry is. Old style candidates for teaching jobs, people who have had a little bit of practice experience, don't look as impressive on the entry level market as their PhD counterparts. Mm -hmm. But if you look at who are the people five and six years into their teaching careers in law schools who are getting lateral offers and moving around, an awful lot of those people are not the PhDs, they're the people who had a little more practice experience. And so it, there's this tension, which is I feel that we're not as good at judging at the entry level market, which of the people with practice experience are gonna turn out to be superstars. And we're also not as capable of judging which of the PhDs are just extremely well-advised graduate students who when they have to come up with their own ideas in a law school might find it harder to do that. Oh. And and then does that suggest that the, not to make it a hierarchy, but the higher ranked schools um, should should not be doing as much uh, junior hiring because they just kind of wait to, to draw. I'm not enough of a baseball fan to draw yeah. this, but yeah. the farm league or the, yeah. you know, just whatever. wait until they become free agents and then sign <laughs> and then pick them up. Um, I, I is that a way of generating better faculty? I actually think that's a mistake because of what I was talking about a moment ago, which is the invest, the institutional investment that people make in their first institution. So, you know, there are some people who are amazing at investing in every institution they go to. I mean, Nate Persley, who's a colleague of mine, is just, you know, the model of that. It's, he's, he's been stunningly uh, institutionally minded and effective at his move from Penn to Columbia and in his move from Columbia to Stanford. Um, but not everybody does that. Um, and a lot of the people at Stanford who I think of as kind of core to the institution in various ways, started their careers here. Um, and so I would be really loath to give up on entry level hiring um, in the assumption that we can hire as good a faculty of people five and six and 10 and 20 years uh, in their careers. And I think as people become less mobile in a bunch of ways, because there are more dual career couples um, and the like, it's going to be harder to do that. I mean, already there are people that I'm sure we would hire in a heartbeat but when we call them and ask them if they want to come for a visit, they don't even want to come for a visit because they've got spouses or kids or, you know, commitments in the community they're in. Um, and, and so I think, you know, if you, if you go that route, I mean, maybe you can go that route, but I think you, you pay a big price. I mean, I think having junior faculty is critical to having, uh, to having a robust institution. I, I want to go back uh, just as a last question to the gendered question of uh, faculty salaries and maybe sort of men are asking repeatedly or trying to get lateral offers to try to raise their salary and um, uh, uh, and maybe maybe more than women. One one answer to that or one way of uh, addressing that is more transparency, either through records request at some places um, or just having everyone's salary be public. Uh, and so I've I've been at schools where yeah everyone's salary was a secret and you had to sort of guess what other pe you know am i am i getting paid okay relative everybody else and i've been at schools where it's just all public and everybody knows what everybody else is making do you have a, a sense of whether making things public is better as a way of addressing those inequalities where you can say look the men are making you know 10%, 20%, whatever the amount is more than women or this is unfair look at the different salaries or does that does that cause more trouble than, than it solves? So, you know, it all depends on what you find out in a way. That is, at a school where the salaries are being set relatively fairly, I think having, a, having um, knowledge of other people's salaries is not problematic at all because it reassures you that you're being paid fairly. At a school where that's not happening for whatever reason, I think knowing other people's salaries just causes anxiety. And there are some people who are really neurotic about that. Um, you know, I have no idea what my colleagues make. 
um, I feel like I am vastly overcompensated for what I do. I would, you know, here's the thing. I would do almost every part of this job for half the salary I'm now making, except for grading. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> and some years, some years, the grading is so painful that I just take my salary for the quarter and I divide it by the number of exams so that I can tell myself that every time I read one of these things, I'm being paid like, you know, $4,500. And then it doesn't seem so bad. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I, when I was at UVA, everybody's salary was public and the Daily Progress, which was the local Charlottesville paper, published everybody's salary once a year. I never looked at it because um, I didn't really want to know. Um, when I first came to Stanford, there were there were some, I'll just tell this one part of the story, which is kind of interesting to me, which is I accepted my offer to come to Stanford the same year as an extraordinarily aggressive man accepted a lateral offer. Uh, and the dean first said to me, you know, here's the offer. And I said, well, I don't think I should have to take a pay cut to come to Stanford. He said, oh, are you being paid more than this? I said, well, yes, actually I am. He said, well, send me your last salary letter from UVA and we'll match it. So uh, he matched it. Um, and then I got the housing program, which, you know, if you didn't have the housing program at Stanford, you wouldn't be able to live within commuting distance of the school. <laughs> right. So the housing program, uh, I, I got my housing program thing. Then every couple of months, the, guy, the chief financial officer of the law school called me up and said, well, we've kind of adjusted the program and now you can do this versus this. And I couldn't understand what was going on until I realized that what happened is this unbelievably aggressive male faculty member just kept jerking the, the law school around and the dean felt a sense of kind of equity that he couldn't create two different housing programs, one for the girls and one for the boys. Um, and it was, it was kind of eye-opening to me because up until then I had always felt, you know, vaguely uncomfortable talking about money. Um, I mean, it's this odd thing, I think, for a, this is true for a lot of lawyers that I find it very easy to demand like unbelievably outrageous stuff on behalf of my clients, but I find it really hard to ask for anything on behalf of myself. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good representative of myself. I'm an excellent representative of my clients. So, it, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that publishing everybody's salary is the best way to make everybody happy. Um, it probably leads some people to be happier than they'd otherwise be and other people not to be. And it's not clear to me which group of people you should care more about. Fair enough. Pam, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. It was oh, terrific thank you. to have you. Thank you. This was really fun. I'm looking forward to watching more of these because uh, as I told you before we started taping, I've really enjoyed the ones that I've gotten to gotten to watch so far. Great. Well, we've got, we've got some good episodes lined up, so I'm excited. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.